In a recent module, we mentioned in passing the snowosphere. This time we'll be taking a greater look at this very important part of climatology, especially its effect on the surface of the Earth. Once upon a time, it was a common belief that flakes of snow fell from the sky onto the ground, creating a layer of snow. In 1854, Edwin Judd and Frederick Morris caused a sensation when they dared to suggest that these snowflakes remain stationary while the Earth moves up to meet it. Unlike the rotational theory, which was prevalent in the 18th century, Judd and Morris's equations are now beyond scientific doubt. Of course, this equation is missing a very important value, which in this instance is represented by the letter H. The snowosphere is a layer of ice crystals that envelops the Earth held in equilibrium by centripetal and centrifugal forces. Approximately 20 miles in height, the snowosphere sits above the troposphere and the stratosphere. This diagram shows quite clearly the temperature difference between the lower three atmospheric layers, which is proportional to their mass and their relative positions above the geosphere. Here I am back in the warmth of the studio. The extension to Judd and Morris's equations made by Cynthia Goodman at Carlisle University recognised that the fundamental equations shouldn't be regarded as holding for all real values of the variables x, y and t. The exceptional domains, or singular points, are instrumental in the production of waves or disturbances within the snowosphere. Take a look at this equation. It's worth noting several variables where the coefficient is equal to or less than the subset of x. Here, 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 and here. The irregular planing of flake nucleates was, of course, a major stumbling block in Morris and Judd's original hypothesis, even with Goodman's extension. But if we look at the following diagram, we can see how the transposition of these particulates has changed significantly as a result of the first and second industrial revolutions. So what exactly is going on here? What is stage five? Well, as you saw, the transposition and precipitation have reached an equilibrium within the lower part of the snowosphere. Now, this might provide us with a clue as to a possible broadening out and diminishing of the snowosphere in years to come. The extent of the snowosphere was first observed at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich in 1954 by D.R. Woodward. Here, microwave radiation was bounced off the upper layer of the snowosphere and refracted back on itself to build up an accurate picture of its composition. Later studies by Hardwick and Mayer highlighted the degree to which the Earth rises exponentially to meet the snowosphere at latitudes above 45 degrees. This is called the zone of maximum precipitation. The easiest way to visualise the effects of the stationary snowosphere on the expanding Earth is to study this equation. Now the vector function m 
is defined for all real world values of i, p and c. And the vectors pv and ip are derived from factors of them. For all points in the regions occupied by the snowosphere, the modified equations are satisfied. Imagine this is the Earth and this is the snowosphere. As the mass of the snowosphere presses downwards, why is the adiabatic rate, the rate of temperature change in the atmosphere due to the raising or lowering of air mass, always zero? Tweeja Pulkenin, head of climatology at the University of Helsinki, thinks she has the answer. The temperature changes we observed when we conducted several field tests on the highest of the glaciers surrounding Helsinki suggested to our research team that isostatic equilibrium was partly responsible for the unusual readings that we took. We have since confirmed this when comparing it to the control reading at sea level. This is a far cry from the accretion of mass theory that was prevalent before Hardwick and Mayer conducted their experiments. Now widely dismissed by the scientific community, mass accretion was still being taught as late as the 1960s. Have a look at what happens when we introduce a weak solution of carbonic acid to a sample of permafrost taken from Baffin Island in Canada. Here in the UK, Professor Hugh Jones, Assistant Head of Graduate Snow Studies at the University of Edge Hill, has been conducting experiments to show that the mass of the snowosphere decreases according to its height from sea level. Here he weighs snow first at ground level and then at roof level to see the difference. As you've just seen in that film clip, mass is relative to the sphere in which its motion is at rest. As the snow sample ascends, it decreases exponentially in mass and thus weight because of gravitational forces. Until at infinitely negative mass, it can decrease no further. Food for thought there, I think you'll agree. Goodbye.